we're going to start out with a question that Peeper begins with that I know we think about, but I think it's salutary to, as an exercise to think about it um, just a little more extensively than we usually do. That is the question of textual choice. So in order to kind of pick you up after lunch, which is always the absolute most difficult time to lecture on anything, just be happy you generally work before lunch, okay, uh, is to think about this question of which text you pick. Let me start out. Um, what I want you to do is go and pick from your lectionary of choice next Sunday's sets of readings, and we're going to get into our Bibles that way. I asked you guys to bring a, new, a Greek New Testament if you have one. If you want to pick an Old Testament text, I can go get my Bible, my Hebrew Bible, um, but I was going to stick with Greek because usually guys are better at Greek than Hebrew. But you want to do that, we can do that. Um, so go look up, whether you're three year or one year, or you made it up, whatever you want to do. Let me just tell you what Peeper discusses. Okay. So obviously in 1903, there is one standard lectionary now called the one year or a little more aggressively the historic lectionary or still more aggressively the lectionary. Um, I also hear these people are my friends, right? Um, so... That's the main one. And if you look at series of what are called postles, which are standard sermons by some sort of exemplary preacher, Luther being the most famous one, on the Gospels or the Epistles, those are in this one-year lectionary. However, something you notice if you know enough of the literature surrounding preaching in the Missouri Synod even at that time, down into the 50s or 60s roughly, is that although those seem to be read all the time, they don't seem always to be preached. So for example, Peeper has a collection of Old Testament sermons in which the Old Testament reading is named for and keyed to the particular Sunday in the historic church year. So down to Septuagesima or Trinity Sunday or... Trinity 14. Now, why is that strange? It's strange because no one was supposed to be particularly reading an Old Testament reading in the service back then. That's really something pretty new, relatively speaking, in the liturgy. Okay? That is the last 50 years that reading the Old Testament has been fairly standard in the service. You might notice other things. If you remember the Lutheran hymnal, the hymnal, right? The Lutheran hymnal, in roughly the middle of the hymnal, before the hymns, are a set of readings, epistle, gospel, maybe even Old Testament, for each Sunday of the year. What are these things? And in the Concordia pulpit series, and even before that, in what was called in German the homiletical magazine, there are sometimes entire sermon series on things like the Eisenach Gospels or the Synodical Conference Epistles or uh, what are all these things? What it seems to be is that uh, they were following a practice somewhat similar to what our sister church in Germany still does, which is the readings for any given Sunday in the year are the same. Those are the readings. That is not necessarily the preaching text. So there's a distinction here between reading texts and preaching texts or lessons and preaching text that allows you, and the Germans have a cycle running, I think maybe six years of texts keyed to that particular Sunday. So liturgically, the year stays in place. That's a difference, for example, you know, if you've done this, switching between the one year and the three year or the three year to the one year is that you get a different church year in ways that not everybody notices, but it's there, right? You don't have pre-Lent or Epiphany is longer or whatever, right? Just a little bit different. Germans don't do that. They have the same year all the time, recognizable to us as the one-year church year, I suppose you could say. And then the preaching text is different. So how do I know what the preaching text is? Well, what's going to happen at the beginning of the sermon 
whether it was already read or whether it wasn't read, is that it's going to be read again. We don't have that practice, really. We have a remnant of it in people saying, the sermon is on the epistle lesson or the gospel lesson. Or sometimes this will happen. There's only one lesson, but the preacher still says, the sermon is on. And part of the reason for that is because it is obviously up in the air if you have three lessons, I suppose. But it's definitely up in the air if you're just introducing a whole new text for the sermon. So it doesn't seem that everything changes drastically liturgically, but they do preach on other things. Okay. They also pick what we call free texts, what they call occasional texts, much more often. So Pieper, when he's talking about picking a free text, will usually yoke it to an occasion. And we all do this for things like funerals and weddings and so forth. But he will do it also for certain Sundays. So this is also in Walther's advice for when you begin a pastorate, that you start out with a sermon on a text about what you're going to be doing, preaching the gospel, preaching the truth, whatever it is, and that that text sets the theme for what you're doing in that place. Okay, So that would be a free text. So let's say your gospel reading that, you know, that Sunday was about the love of money or something, maybe you can turn that into a sermon about what you're not going to do, or I don't know, but you would be better served to just pick a more directly obvious applicable text and go with that. But that's the use of a free text or what they call a casual text, an occasional text. So they have, I think, in some ways more options than we do because there's a book you can pick up called Biblical Texts it's a big collection of these things by a guy named Paul Nesper. And in there you get, I want to say, 15 different lectionaries. So this predates the three-year lectionary. Um, you get about 15 different ones, partly because each German state has its own lectionary. So Tomasius is for Bavaria. There's a Göttingen. There's Eisenach. There's all these different lectionaries. Um, there's even a pastor named Soul, Frederick Soul, who was a Wisconsin Synod pastor, who wrote two different preaching lectionaries that are really pretty insightful, especially when they're linked with the one year. So they, they illuminate other things about the one year. Here's another thing to consider, is that when they're thinking about the preaching text, how many texts are they assuming you're gonna preach on? Especially if we already read two or three and now I'm gonna do another one in the sermon. How many, how many different texts am I preaching on in a given sermon? Give me a number. One. One, just one. You're not trying to pull the Old Testament and the epistle and the gospel all together in the same sermon. Do you guys do that? You pull them together? So that's kind of a hermeneutical change. This is a, I think, there's several things that and when I want to talk about lectionaries, and I don't want to do it like, um, this is what I do, and this is why the one year is the best thing ever, or the three. I mean, I don't care. I want to talk about them kind of in a pragmatic way. One thing that the three year has changed is our sense of how the readings are supposed to fit together, because the Old Testament and the gospel are keyed to each other in a way that really didn't happen before. Okay. Um, now, I, I have heard, I have sat there for hour-long presentations on, you know, the secret ins and outs of the one-year lectionary and how the epistle and the gospel really are, like, in some sort of Masonic way, like, secretly linked to each other. But I'm happy with just thinking, like, they're sort of related, and, and sometimes they're not, or sometimes I'm just stupid, or whatever the problem is. But they're definitely not linked the way the Old Testament and the gospel were set up to talk to each other in the three year. And I think that that has caused something which, I mean, it's fine, it just hasn't happened before, which is you, you can really touch very easily on multiple readings in the same sermon because they're meant to talk to each other, whereas previously this is not generally the case. Um, lectionary discussion. That came from a certain place maybe for us particularly with the reworking of lectionaries with lsb 
And so then the people that were involved in those reworking of lectionaries, I know part just is kind of, at least in my experience, a little bit of a proponent of tying these readings together. Yeah. And maybe Stukwish was on that committee. And so I like, if there's a change in what we're doing, I like to know who are the movers behind how the changes come so you can investigate it more. Sure. Okay. So the, the tying of the Old Testament to the gospel, and especially that the Old Testament is linked generally typologically to the gospel, okay, is, does not come from us. It comes from the original Roman Catholic source for a three-year lectionary. So in the 1950s and 60s, there are multiple different proposals across the world for, along with other liturgical changes, for new lectionaries. There's a two-year lectionary in Britain. There's a four-year one that's being proposed in other places. As we have received it, it really is a product of um, Roman Catholic efforts to create greater biblical understanding. And it was crafted in a way that I'm not really sure a lectionary ever has been before, not one in wide use, by people who are professionally exegetes. So things are, you're supposed to bring out specific, you know, accents and nuances of each gospel, obviously, but then you're also tying those gospels in a way that can sometimes be fairly complex, but sometimes is fairly obvious, like number six goes with John three. You're going to do that so that you understand the Old Testament through the Gospels. And we just received that in receiving the three-year lectionary. The editing that we did usually has to do with adding more stuff in that is excluded because both Roman Catholics and mainline Protestants will take out things that are violent or hard to understand or et cetera, especially in the Old Testament. So go ahead. Yeah. I just know that they did a lot of recreating with LSB so that that now someone says the historic lectionary and somebody who knows laughs because they've amended it so much. But then I remember there were uh, emphasis is to bring in more uh, historic historical happenings, events, the parting of the Red Sea versus more prophecy yes. as LSB's lectionaries were coming together. And yeah. To be fair, with the one-year lectionary, they also added the Old Testament, which links very closely, and the epistle almost always links in, whereas in the three-year lectionary, it's lex continua. You know, you, it rarely links very well. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you're going to have proponents on each side. Uh, so, but, you know, you got to look at the strengths and weaknesses of each. Yeah. Um, well, on, on that point, that the LSB also, they added in the, the historic, they added the option for epistles, where they'll, they'll give you the historic one and the, the new one, and the new one's meant to link where the old one's simply doesn't all the time, which is kind of interesting. Um, but what I was going to ask is, do you know, it doesn't seem like the classical Lutheran preachers uh, had the rubric of preaching only on the gospel, which is something that I hear a lot of from our friends who are proponents of the Lutheran lectionary. Do you know, like, when what the origins of that rubric or? The only preach on the gospel thing, um, I, do, I don't know where David Scare got it. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I understand theologically where he got it. I don't know when he started it or if anyone else ever did it before. Uh, David Scare, it's in Lang. Is that right? Adrian knows Lang. Is it in Lang? Uh, I know Fritz Eckert is a huge proponent of this in the Godestines crowd. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't remember if Lang speaks of it or not. Um, Theologically, I, under, I see where he's getting it, um, but it, it usually involves, and what I'll find is, especially in Fort Wayne graduates, that it's just kind of like ingrained, like they were told to do it. Or um, I had a guy the last time I taught this say, well, I don't preach on the epistles because those are the sermons of the apostles and you don't preach 
that's a sermon on a sermon, so you don't. So that, <laughs> notice that, that none of that is being run through the rubric of this is the word of God. Ergo, <laughs> I preach on it, right? So um, it's just coming from a different place as David Scare does theologically. Just a little factoid is that David Scare is the nephew of Richard Kemmerer. Art, Art Just was once a proponent of that also. He used to talk about a canon within a canon yeah. um, that, uh, that in his estimation, the Gospels were sacrosanct compared to the rest of the scriptures. And so I don't know that he would necessarily only preach on the Gospels, but but they were teaching us that that every, I mean, different than Luther has this Pauline theology. They they were running it everything through the Gospels, and so I'll, I'll toss I'll toss out that at least for people that are newly installed or ordained, I think you know what we were told was you're you'll be less likely to screw up preaching the gospel text in your first in your first you know handful of years but yeah and well and that has to do with text choice and one thing that i'm going to contend throughout the week is that we generally don't screw up in text choice or even in exegesis we screw up in arrangement that's where we ride hobby horses that's where we don't cover the text. So I'm going to contend that these things don't matter. I think it's, I think all of this is interesting, but the place that we really screw up is in arrangement. Yeah. Well, I've heard for the gospel reading to preach on that is it's not theological. It's a practical, it's easier to do because it's a story and people that the parishioners want to hear stories. They can follow that along easier. That's, that was one way I, I that was explained to me, but in, in my preaching class, we, we would preach, the Psalms. I mean, Dr. Rista had us preach Psalms, so <laughs> so it wasn't just no. You're just going to do the gospel. No. I think. I mean, one thing you can you can see here is that when when you talk about preaching, you're always also talking about some kind of hermeneutic. That is, they're all supposed to tie together, or the gospel governs the rest of them, or whatever the case may be. And I think one of the one of the issues here. This is open for discussion. I don't have some kind of hard and fast opinion about it, partly because older preachers don't talk about the liturgy nearly as much as we do. For better or worse, they just don't talk about it all the time. So Peeper doesn't have some kind of extensive discussion, for example, nor really does Kemmerer of how the different readings relate to each other and how that relates to the sermon and how that relates to communion. And maybe that's because of communion frequency, or maybe that's because of the liturgical movement or whatever, but their sense of what matters or what's important just is vastly different. So he's, when he's talking about text choice, Peeper, he's just talking about that text. Yeah, go ahead. The, a lot of the older pastors, if they even had a class on worship, it was how to do, not why you do. Uh, most of them didn't even have a class on worship. But then some primacy of the gospel in an age of liturgical renewal has to do with uh, the German chorale, Bach, um, the Lutheran hymnody, which is primarily keyed off the gospel text of the historic church year. So if we're singing on the last Sunday of the church year, Wach it auf, then to preach on a text other than the Ten Virgins when when we've had this uh, resurgence of use of hymn of the day and that kind of thing, um, there's... So that, yeah, so one of the issues here is that whenever someone is appropriating the past, he's always appropriating part of it because it's just not possible to get it all at the same time. So if he appropriates, let's do the hymn of the day, then we're going to do the gospel reading because Luther usually preached on the gospel. What he's appropriating is the main service at a city church in Germany at a certain time. He's not covering maybe the earlier service and he's not covering the evening service where the epistle is traditionally handled, nor is he covering the daily service where continuous reading, Lexio Continua, is done, which is where you get a lot of commentaries from the Reformation era 
are really sermons continuously on a book of the Bible, similar to what we're familiar in America with the Reformed or Baptists doing. So you appropriate one part of it, it's, and that, that, that's really conditioned liturgically. It's not conditioned textually. And that's why you're only preaching on the gospel. You're doing it 95% of the time or whatever. The other hermeneutical thing that I heard in what Trey said is, like we said before we broke for lunch, is that a lot of preaching advice is conditioned by the estimation of the hearers. And usually it's a fairly low estimation. Um, and the reason I wonder about this is because if you just think about it sociologically, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is middle class, okay? Like pretty firmly. We're not the Episcopalians, we're not the Pentecostals. We're pretty middle class. But I could go to a Pentecostal church and they would demand an hour-long sermon of me. Or I go to a Baptist church that's full of plumbers and they're expecting me to follow in my Bible like discussion of justification and election, and the Lutherans are like, no, our people are too dumb. Let's just give them stories. I mean, it's, it's a certain assumption about people that isn't even true in churches that demonstrably have a, a lower educational standard, for example. Right? So just formal, can you sit there in a lecture and handle it? Can you handle a concept like election? <laughs> Lots of people say yes. We say, nah, maybe not, you know. Um, and so there are all of these, I mean, in theological terms, anthropological ideas about our people, are they regenerate, but also are they bright enough to sit there and patiently follow? And, and in the past, that certainly is not the case. So eighth grade education is kind of standard, let's say, in a rural area down to the 50s or 60s. Go back and look at some of these German language sermons. They're verbally complex. They're theologically complex. I mean... Our people might only be able to follow stories and have a low vocabulary, but then again, how much do they know about the history of the Denver Broncos? So why do they know all that? Well, because they've devoted time to it. The reason they can't understand what we're saying is because they don't devote any time and we're not forcing them to. You know? So that's, there's, that's part of, I think, some of this too. Other lectionary discussion. Anybody? One year, which is sort of historic and sort of not in LSB, as Sawyer pointed out. I mean, you're doing the Old Testament, so that's not historic. But it has the same hermeneutic as the three-year at this point. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, the Old Testament, I, I did find, uh, as we did it, is they pretty much followed the Gerhard uh, uh, sermons. So a lot of times they'll take the Old Testament that he used to start with, and that is now our Old Testament in the one-year lectionary. Interesting. So there we go, you know, and that's how these, that's how the sausage is made. And I think sometimes people talk about lectionaries like it's not sausage, you know, <laughs> like it just fell out of the sky or is the best, obviously. And I'm not, I'm not sure about all that. Does anyone not use a lectionary for any, I mean, other than like weddings and funerals, you ever depart. This is just for my own interest. Okay, I don't go anywhere that anyone does that. The only person I know that regularly does that is Jonathan Fisk. So, and Jonathan does whatever he wants, right? So, um, <laughs> so it keeps it keeps the church here. But um, like on Reformation, I was there for Reformation a couple years ago, and I preached on Galatians three, which is very Lutheran. It's about justification by faith, but it's nobody else's reading on Reformation Sunday. Um, so, but his sermons run more like Bible classes in the sense that they're probably about 40 minutes and they're very textually thorough. So not only is he reading something different, he's also doing something different than almost any of us. Um, just kind of an interesting thing, but yeah, Dwight. I just wonder if it's a factor, but I do know a pastor in the Denver area who had a, a regular radio program. And for the most part, when I'd listen to it, he would not be following the lessons of the day at all. He would pick up sort of general topics that would appeal more to a wider audience. So that's a really good point because for the history, not of homiletics, but of preaching in the Missouri Synod, relatively few people are more important for the people's sense of preaching at a certain point than Walter Meyer on the Lutheran Hour. 
And interestingly, Kemmer, who was first a contemporary, then a colleague, doesn't like Walter Meyer. Um, <laughs> he likes some of his successors. Now, probably none of you knows who Armin Oldson was. I don't, if you do, I'm gonna, you do? I'm imp no, I'm legitimately impressed, Dwight, because <laughs> I've never encountered anyone else who knows this name. But he's like, oh, these are great sermons. Walter Meyer gets filed by Kemmerer under, if you want to read some evangelistic sermons, there's Billy Graham and there's Walter Meyer. Okay. And, um, but Meyer was not trying to preach. So people say, oh, well, Meyer never talks about baptism or he doesn't talk about the Lord. And that's not true. Sometimes he does talk about these things, but he's preaching evangelistic sermons. So they're not on the lesson of the day. Not that I've ever discerned. And they're not really intended for Christians to encourage them to take the Lord's Supper or something. They're pretty basic calls to repentance and faith. And that makes sense to me if I'm preaching to a general audience. That the lectionaries are built for Christians and Christian congregations. And there are occasions in which you're just not there. So if you do a, if you do a funeral sermon and it sounds exactly like your Sunday sermon be a little odd, especially considering who generally shows up for funerals, right? That's probably the closest most of us get to a purely evangelistic sermon. Um, I guess depends on the family, right? Any other lectionary thoughts, choices, questions before we go on? Anybody? Are, are you going to talk about like picking the different between Old Testament epistle and gospel more? Or do you want to? How? Yeah, like I know some guys will at the beginning of the year go through and pick, you know, what they're going to preach on, yeah. and then some will say this year's Old Testament year, this year's Gospel year. Um, I've heard of that. I just, you know, sit at the on Monday morning and. So th this pertains to something that um, Peeper doesn't talk about, Kemmerer doesn't really talk about. Um, I find pretty infrequently with Lutherans, but that is the sense that your preaching could actually be controlled and thought out long before you know, I'm going to say this, long before you get there. So um, Mount Calvary, I'm doing three months. I'm doing sometimes six months for myself in advance. Basic, these are the readings. Here are the hymns. Here's my preaching text. And that has a conscious flow. So a simple example of this would be, if you're in the three-year in the summer, you can exegete almost an entire epistle, sometimes a whole epistle, right then and there. You don't need to, and you can plan that out, and then you can have things actually connected to each other, obviously and thematically and coherently in the same way that you do for Bible class, at least sometimes. I rarely find Lutherans talking about that. What I find much more often is just description of a Sunday to Sunday process in which your head is just barely above water. And homiletically, it's not because you're just kind of, you start thinking about it maybe on Sunday evening or Monday, or you come into work on Tuesday or whatever your, your cycle is. So the thing that I found about this that, I've, that I have found helpful is a book by a guy named Stephen Rummage called Planning Your Preaching. And he recommends, it's still in print. It's like 25 years old. It's still in print. Um, he recommends, I mean, you can do this for a year. He's like, you just need to take some days and do it for a year. And he's not writing a year's worth of sermons, but he's planning where they're going over the course of a year. And for him, he's usually preaching through books. So here's where we're going to go in Luke, and then we're going to take a break, or we're going to do this at Christmas, and we're going to do this at Easter, and he's going to leave himself three weeks in the summer in case he goes on vacation. And then if he doesn't, he can just plug something in for three weeks. Since we generally all use a lectionary, it is set out. All I'm really doing is picking and then doing basic outlining. And then I get there and I mean, I do this for lectures too. So like, I know what I'm saying at this place in November. Why wouldn't I do that with sermons? So that's how I pick is how they are related to what's going to happen afterward. So if I'm going to do this in the Old Testament this week, I want it to be connected to this in the Gospels the three weeks after that, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So in the, in the same way that you teach Bible class, right? 
So I try to highlight at the beginning of Bible class, here's what we did last week, but really only the stuff that's connected to what I'm about to do. <laughs> okay. And then at the end, here's the stuff that we just did. And here's what I'm going to connect to what we're going to do next week. So same thing in preaching. Um, but rummage is good. Um, and the other books like it are too old and probably out of print. So I'm not going to, we can talk about them if you want to, but yeah. Um, that creates, if you will, a sermon series or a sense of interconnection between Sundays sermonically that we usually don't, we, we usually don't have. Or if we do do sermon series, they're explicitly topical and they're non-lectionary. But I think you can easily do it on the lectionary. You just have to think about how you're arranging the material. Yeah. Um, other text choice or, or lectionary things, anybody? So, but I'm pretty agnostic about which one it's going to be. Um, Old Testament epistle or gospel. It's not, I want them to be connected thematically rather than worrying about, well, I, I'm doing too much Old Testament or I'm doing too much of the gospels or whatever. Yeah. I think we all lean in different directions naturally. That, <laughs> that's not a good reason to pick any one particular text. <laughs> and sometimes I like to pick the one where I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that means. So then, Hopefully by Sunday, I will have something that I can say about it. Yeah. Um, anything else with lectionaries or text choices from anybody? Okay. So once you pick your text, this is where we go into a couple of things about how people read scripture. And I'm going to compare that to Kemmerer just as a helpful foil. Okay. So with Kemmerer, um, He's going to be looking for what the goal of the text is, which is good, what the goal of the text is. And that's going to help me formulate in this goal, malady, means thing, that's going to help me formulate what the goal of the sermon is going to be. Peeper doesn't go that fast. So Peeper starts with, what is the, this is his phrase, so I'm going to give it to you just so you have it. What is the logical, the logical, the logical or grammatical sense of the text. So before I ask what its aim, what it's trying to do, my basic question is what does the text mean? So Pieper will, for that reason, have a lot more material than Kemmerer. I mean, Kemmerer almost assumes he'll have a lot more material about this is how you do exegesis in the original languages. If I read Kemmerer, I still know that I'm supposed to take the original languages, but I'm not exactly sure why? <laughs> I guess just so we have enough credits in the, I don't know, curriculum. I'm not really sure. With Peeper, there's, a, there's kind of a deeper theological reason for it, okay? And the theological reason is that there is some sense that the Holy Spirit has given to the words. That sense is often called, when we have these kinds of discussions, the literal sense, but literal sounds like wooden in English, but it just means the sense of the letters in Latin. It's a Latin-derived word, literal. But Pieper more often calls that the logical sense or sometimes the grammatical sense. What do I do when I find it? Well, what I do with it is that's going to drive what I am saying. So before I ask about aim, before I ask about what's wrong, before I ask about how I'm going to fix what's wrong, malady means, I'm going to ask, what does the text say? I'm also going to ask, how does the text say it? So give you an example. Sometimes people preach on Proverbs and they sound very much unlike Proverbs because Proverbs sounds like this. Deep relationship, father, son, general principle. The son is going to have to implicitly figure out what to do with the general principle about business or about marriage or about whatever, right? I have heard sermons on Proverbs, not really by Lutherans because Lutherans aren't preaching on Proverbs too much, right? But I've heard sermons on Proverbs that sound very different than Proverbs in this way, that they give me tons of specific direction which Proverbs did not provide about business or marriage or whatever. It gave me, for instance, a general image that 
A nagging wife is like incessant dripping in a roof. Well, that's evocative, but it's not very specific. It tells me something about the words that pass between a married couple. It tells me something about what is undesirable or needs to be fixed, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell me these are the five steps you take to stop your leaky roof, right? So the issue here is that not only do I know, want to know what the text says, but I also want to know how it's going about saying what it says. And here's one more thing from Peeper about reading Scripture. When he talks about reading Scripture, he talks about it as meditation. Meditation. So there's this assumption, and this is more of a pastoral theological point than a specifically homiletical one, is that when pastors are talked to about reading the Bible, there's two different ways that the Bible should be read that you find in pretty much any pastoral theology. One is what Pieper describes as meditation, that is deep study, intensive, on some specific portion. Okay, just pull it apart. Last week, for example, I spent a lot of time, I don't know that I even used it particularly, but I spent a lot of time finding where the sometimes oblique references in Hebrews were in the Old Testament and then what the Old Testament setting was for each of those references. And that did play into the three different sections of the sermon as to my tone, because two were from Deuteronomy and one was from Proverbs. That's meditation, okay? So it takes time. Um, This is where I think some pastors have difficulty today, although they had this difficulty in the past too before their phones and their watches and their computers. They have time. They have a lot of trouble taking time to do things. I know they always had this trouble because the case is always being made by either the guy in the homiletics book or the guy in the pastoral theology saying, You need to take the time. So I know that the pastors were not, even in the 17th century, taking the time to meditate. And why not? Because it feels maybe self-indulgent or there are things you could do instead of thinking or whatever. But meditation is understood as necessary, especially for preaching. The other kind of Bible reading, this is the more general point, the other kind is what's called cursory. That is, Instead of saying, I'm going to work on Luke 10 today, just Luke 10, going to find its sources in the Old Testament if it has any, etc., I'm going to sit down and just read half of Luke this morning. This is how you get preaching. So this is my point. This is not Peepers. This is how you get preaching, not only such as, say, Luther does, but especially such as the church fathers do, where it seems that they're unable sometimes to say anything except in scriptural phrases. How could this be? Because it really just oozes out of them because they have been drenched in it. Paul is similar. Did you ever notice how Paul says little tiny fragments of things from the Old Testament and applies them to contemporary, apparently totally different situations. Example from the three-year epistle from this past Sunday, right? See that there be no root of bitterness in you, okay? So that is a reference to covenant renewal and ripping out, ripping out of Israel what would destroy Israel. Or example, 1 Corinthians 5, purge the evil from among you. That actually involves the death penalty in the Old Testament. Paul uses it for excommunication in 1 Corinthians 5. Okay? So if I have enough of that, then it just comes out. The other thing that you'll notice in an unconscious way is that it makes all preaching about 400 times easier. Because you're like somebody who hasn't just read you know, you can tell this with teachers, even when you're a high schooler, there's the English teacher you have that's trying to teach you Hamlet. And you can tell that she's only ever read like Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet. Okay. 
Now, that doesn't stop people from being extremely confident, limited knowledge. They still just go ahead. There's a big difference between that person, however, and the one who's read all the plays multiple times and now is telling you about Hamlet. So there's a dryness that enters into preaching, especially when the preacher doesn't do the cursory reading, just does the meditation. And the meditation, let's be honest, is I looked at it in English and then I had some ideas and away I go because I don't have a lot of time. That time pressure or that speed have always been problems. Preachers are always being told to slow down in homiletics books, <laughs> which I find remarkable because it happens whether you have, you know, your watch is dinging or, you know, your buggy is waiting outside or you just got your telegram or you got whatever your smoke signal, I don't know, uh, all the way in the past. They're always going fast. And what happens then is that fast always means for somebody who's teaching, fast always ends up being shallow. I mean, it, I don't have another option. If it, if it has to go out, something has to come in, right? So there's two different kinds of Bible reading are always being commended. The one specific to homiletics that Pieper talks most about is how to do meditation. Thoughts on the two different kinds of Bible reading or reading the Bible generally that you want to discuss, um, reading for preaching, anything while we're here. Anybody? What does this meditation quite look like? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be original text. And I'm going to work until I know what everything means in just a really simple way. So this is why uh, when Walter's talking about books you must own, he says you need a concordance and you need a Bible dictionary. So I can go look up Hivites if I need to because it's worth it. And then once I have that, then if I want to, I can write it out, but I can do it in my mind. I can produce an outline of its meaning and how the meanings fit together. Because that outline of how it fits together is going to be mapped as, you know, adjusted for the fact that now it has to be explained to someone else. That's going to be mapped for my sermon, especially in the form that Peeper's going to call it analytical. I don't remember who the text was, but Celeska gave it to us. I don't even think it was a text. It had something to do with the preparation of a sermon throughout the week. Yeah. And so it was directing on Sunday. Before you go home, you read the text from the next week. And on Monday, it might be your day off, but you do this with the text today. And it went on and on and on. Right. But but there was a certain element in those things that the men were praying about the text that they were they were going to be preaching on but meditation to me does not necessarily have so much to do with an intense study where here i have my things that i'm studying but meditation has to do more with just some thought um, so I was just wondering, yeah. what more, how does this meditation look? So there's prayer and meditation, but you're right, there is a difference. For Peeper, meditation involves much more study. And I mean, we have a remnant of this idea in the fact that it's not the pastor's office, it's his study. So that's the idea. And then, I mean, this is sort of basic, at least for all Lutherans. So pretty much any book from the 19th century that you're going to get about pastoral theology in any, in any language that the Lutheran speaks is going to do a two-part day. They're not really doing evening meetings so much. And the first part of the day is study, and the second part of the day is visitation. And the study is textually specific. It's not just, like, I, I know guys, <laughs> there's a guy that, he said, um, he's trying to explain why he's never around. And he said, well, I'm always working. You know, when I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about the text. It's like, I get what you mean, but that's not what. Classically, they mean you are working on this, and here's the meaning of that, and then here's how this works with the congregation. And Because the other stuff, yeah, I think is natural. And I think also this process speeds up the more you do it, right? I mean, the better you know the original languages, for example, the less time it takes. But... 
But yeah, but it is a it's a textually focused thing. I don't really think being in the shower is necessarily sermon preparation, but I do think, particularly as I have become older in the ministry, that that the libraries are somewhat in your mind now, and it is so much better than when you were a new pastor and you just you didn't even know who the people were in the Bible or something you know you have to preach a text you just have to figure out just the most rudimentary things but as you get older and you've taken in so many things then the role of meditation what I may do is sit there with my Greek New Testament and read it and set it down and just meditate read it some more set it down meditate some more so that you become your own commentary as opposed to what did this guy say about this thing or or follow through specifically i was just interested in the meditation yeah and well the commentary thing brings up a the meditation process is on the original text and any other parts of scripture that may illuminate it it is not, as I sometimes hear, so guys will say, well, the reason I do the one year is so I can read Luther and I can read. Peeper does not say you should be doing that. Like maybe later in the week, if you want to go look at it, but, but don't use it to prepare your sermon. So it's very textually focused. Yes. Um, other of these meditation questions or similar things. I think some of this definitely, and I think very obviously speeds up the more you do it. Um, do we have a text that you guys have picked out? Do you have one? Do you have one, Trey? You actually have your hymnal open maybe. Well, we can just do it when I'm preaching next. So we, well, it's a couple of weeks. So Luke 15, one through 10. <laughs> Luke 15, one to 10. So we're going to use, the, we're going to use our Bibles now, which is not going to kill anybody. Um, one thing, this is just a recommendation I have. Peeper, Peeper doesn't say this. Um, Kemmerer doesn't say it. Kemmerer just assumes you know a lot of this stuff, which I understand because he's getting a lot more specialized by his time. The exegetes are supposed to handle this. One thing I would recommend you do, I know, I know this is going to sound like crazy, is that you learn how to say it out loud and that you do say it out loud. Um, because there's a divorce that we have between reading and talking or between texts and speech that they don't have and we don't actually have in the service. I mean, why do you want the pastor to read the lessons instead of somebody else? Kind of two ways you can answer this. One is devote yourself to the reading of scriptures and instruction given to a pastor, okay? That's not particularly convincing to people sometimes, but it is there in the Bible. The other reason is that, uh, as my kids know, when I read stories, the reading is interpretive. That is, it's kind of a lower level version of the same thing that happens in the sermon. The person authorized to interpret, interprets. Now that happens really obviously in the sermon, but it also happens in the reading. It happens in the reading even if the person sounds sort of, as people do when they read the Bible in church a lot of times, bored. Okay. Um, you know, this is, this is the word of the Lord. As they were drawing near to him, many. So the reading, the, the reading and the preaching, I really don't think are all that distinct. There's sort of a distinction of intensity, but not a distinction of kind. Both are interpreting the word of God. So it's helpful to you, whether you're doing English or Greek or Hebrew, to read it aloud. And the more you do it, also the easier the recognition of words becomes if you're working in the original. Okay, so I'm going to read aloud, and I'm going to do this by sections. So one thing to note about, um, is that on the three-year? Trey, that's on the three-year. Is that the three-year will generally follow the paragraphing that's in Nestle Allen right now. 
So Nestle Allen's paragraphing sometimes changes between editions. And another thing to notice if you have Nestle Allen open is that on the inside margin, see what I'm looking at? It's got all these different letters, okay? But at 14 verse 28, for example, it's got the italicized 55. And then at the beginning of 15.3, it's got italicized 56. That tells you how the earliest manuscripts divide up the chapters. So there are way more chapters in early manuscripts than in ours. So here's what people closer to that time thought belonged together. Just something to keep in mind. So drawing near to him are all the tax collectors and the sinners to hear him. So if you want to go with this whole chapter is going to govern the next three things you're going to hear, which are these two parables and then what? Everybody loves this one. I mean, this is, this feels easy as the prodigal son from 11 onward, right? If you want to do that, then remember that the general setting is the complaint of the Pharisees that he is receiving sinners and that he actively eats with them. Okay? So when I'm thinking about this for the purposes of preaching, I'm thinking about not only the classes of people, we're going to have different classes, especially in the prodigal son, classes based on behavior, classes based on religious allegiance. I'm also thinking about this fact of being far away or close. Because when I get lots of things that are going to be lost, those seem far away and I need to bring them close to me. Okay? Okay. Notice that he's rejoicing as he's carrying the thing. He doesn't set it down and then rejoice. He's happy to bear the burden. So he's got his friends and his relatives, but the, the friends come first. So he's called the lost one in four, and then the man calls it the lost one in six. The sinner who is repenting, ongoing. Um, since you're on the three year, you have time to do this. Um, I find that when I'm preaching the one year, I, I tend to blend texts more and blend words more. One thing to notice is that the description of people as the righteous in Luke is pretty much always ironic. Whereas in Matthew, it's not, right? So in Matthew, I receive righteous ones, the righteous hoidikaios, and prophets in the name of Jesus. And I give them a cup of cold water and I'm blessed for it. But in Luke, it's usually ironic. So let's just finish out the reading and then we'll talk about where we go from here because we're going to use, we'll just use this text for the rest of the afternoon. Etiskune drachmas ekusa deka ean apolesai drachme mian, uhi hapte luknon, kasaroitin oikian, kazete epimelos eos hu cure. So just like the first one, I began with essentially a rhetorical question. That's going to tell me something about how perhaps I want to run the sermon. Maybe I want to do rhetorical questions. Kaihurusa sukale tasfilas, so she calls her female, her girlfriends, tasfilas. Kaigetonas legosa sukaritemoi, but she says the same thing as the man. And it's again about rejoicing. Kaihuron tendrachmenhen apolisa, 
Hutos lego humin ginita chara enopion tonangelon. There is more joy before the angels to theu of God, epi heni hamartolo metanounti. Upon or about one sinner who is repentant. All right. So, one thing to do here is I'm going to look for where else are words like righteous or repenting used? Where else is joy used? In connection with Adrian's sermon this morning, where else are angels? Because angels are there at the start. Angels are there at the end. And then angels usually in the Gospels pretty much disappear. But in these parables, the angels are kind of the main guys at the end of this part of the parable because they are so happy. They are rejoicing along with the one who finds the sheep and the one who finds the coin. They're rejoicing that this is so. Right? So, wow, I just got angels where I usually never have angels. I mean, go find an angel in like John 12, right? Um, go find an angel in Mark 8. They're not around so much. But in Luke, they do appear in connection with the sinners who are repenting. They're not rejoicing over the righteous, but they are pretty happy about this. Okay. So that's, that's one place to start. Let's talk about introductions to get into Peeper's process of how I start putting the sermon together. <laughs> and he just says very simply, and we'll take a break in a second, that introductions should introduce. Now, I know that sounds like the dumbest, most obvious thing in the world, but you've all sat, and maybe many of you have preached sermons, where the introduction doesn't introduce you to anything. Okay? So, you come into the room this morning, and um, I tell you where the bathroom is, and I tell you where the coffee is, but I don't say what my name is. That's a little weird, but pastors do that with sermons all the time. Here's the introduction. Did it get me anywhere? No. Well, maybe it got me a laugh, or maybe now I know that about the pastor's, you know, um, high school football career, or whatever the case may be. But the idea here is that the introduction needs to be pretty brief, because it's not actually that important. It needs to be pretty brief because it needs to get me into the text, into the sermon that is on the text. And the introduction is, <laughs> Pieper describes it as dangerous <laughs> because it's not that important if you do it well, but it's really important if you don't do it well. Okay, so it's really not that hard to drive a Honda Civic, but if you're just bad at driving, that can also become a death machine, right? It might be objectively harder to drive a monster truck, but if you're bad at driving, you can destroy lots of things with a Honda Civic. So the introduction, not that important, doesn't need to be that impressive, just needs to get people somewhere, like a Civic does. But if you do it poorly, especially if it is distracting or unconnected to the text, then it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not even worthy of the name, right? So I'll give you an example of an introduction that maybe you could take for 15. If you have an idea, we can do it and then we'll take a break. Is that in order to introduce this, one of the things I could do is set the scene that is set in 15, 1, and 2. Let's say, for example, that my theme, we don't have one yet, but let's say that my theme is going to be something about close and far away, okay? Or my theme could be, which is drawn more from one and two, or what, let's just start with that one. We won't talk about lost or joy or anything yet. Close and far away. So what I'm going to do in the introduction is just paint a picture of how everyone is sort of staged relative to Jesus, based on whether they're Pharisees or sinners, or let's say it in terms you get elsewhere in Luke, righteous and sinners. One thing I could do is point out in the introduction how Luke is going to talk about this very often. In 18, the Pharisee is going to be really close to the front of church, and the publican is going to be all the way at the back, 
So this idea of being close or far away is one that I can then run out of one and two into my explanation of the text, right? I can pick something different if I'm going to have a different theme, but if that's going to be sort of where I'm going, that's a place I can start. It's going to introduce everything else that I'm doing, okay? Um, other introduction ideas or introduction questions before we take a little break? Anybody? Where did the massive introductions come from? This would be probably in the, I don't know if it'd be in the 80s or something like that. Don Defner would talk very much about storytelling and that the people of God are not in the same place as the preacher. And so you have to kind of give them an on-ramp to uh, help bring them from where their thoughts are into the text. And it seemed that, that these were very long introductions. Would Walter Meyer have something to do with these things? <coughs> what I think we do is we always are correcting. And so the introductions got really long and now you have guys that won't even have an introduction at all. And so where do the, why the course corrects? How, how do these things become? Um, course correct, I think, is just father-son relationships. Dad did this, I'm not going to. <laughs> Dad always wore high top sneakers with blue jeans. I will never do that, you know, whatever, whatever the case was. Um, the length of introduction is gonna vary partly by what different generations believe that they're doing. So the introduction, but also in the case of Don Duffner, and that is, that's in his Compassionate Preaching, which is kind of his homiletics book. Um, and I think Fort Wayne has only, only Fort Wayne has ever published it, is this idea that story is the most powerful thing in a human being's life. And there's a way in which I'm like, okay, I see the truth in that, um, but that itself is a proposition. So I guess propositions matter to some degree. And so um, I, I, a, a lot of what is behind preaching is usually someone's educational theory. And behind people's educational theory is their theory about human beings' capacity for understanding or interest or whatever. And what I find, especially the closer you get to the present, is this is how people are. So if you're over here, you come down to here. And like I said, with the, with the comparison of, I don't actually think like churches that have lower educational standards than ours, as a, I mean, sociologically, I don't think they all think that way. I think they think that people need to come here. But we often just, Think, and I don't, I think we're actually kind of insulting their intelligence, to be honest with you. But we kind of go down, because all you can really grasp is, you didn't go to seminary, so I'll just give you stories. And what happens then is that the story, instead of being illustrative, like it gives me a little bit more like flip on that switch, a little bit more light in the room. The story instead is basically the way you understand life. And then the Bible really just becomes an additional overhead light because the story is more memorable and the story is more powerful than whatever it was supposed to be illustrating technically. Yeah. I think, I think it's a, it also illustrates a laziness in dealing with the text. I know that's harsh to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so I can come up with a good story about how Chick-fil-A is about customer service. Yeah, and your people like, oh, they're a, oh, that's a Christian business. Yeah, I like when I go through the drive through at chick yeah. but But so you, you think, wow, this is a really good, man, this is going to be a good hook. And it, it's disconnected from the text. Right. Yeah, it is. What the text is actually saying, which you should have meditated on to draw an illustration from the text. Especially when the text is a story. Can't you just vividly portray that story? Like, that wouldn't be so bad. But yeah, I mean, this is a temptation that occurs in other parts of the church's life. Like, in missions, this is doing everything for a group of people except communicating the gospel to them. So you'll give them this, and you'll give them that, and you'll open, like, 
you'll, I mean, maybe we could open a brew pub, right? I mean, there's not enough of those around here, so we could do that. And then people would come and it would be in a Christian atmosphere. But Chick-fil-A has never communicated the gospel to me. So I'm glad that they're, I mean, good, be closed on Sundays. That's great. Um, but they've never, but they're not claiming to be church. But the church is very often tempted to do everything except communicate the gospel. Yeah, go ahead. The other thing when you're using examples like that is the danger is to remember the example, but not what it was pointing towards, what you, what you were supposedly pointing it to, the text. Yeah, there are sermons I remember where all I remember is the illustration. So that happens. Yeah. So regarding introductions, yes. you read Walther's sermons in the gospel sermon volumes, and he begins with a couple paragraphs, even a page of an introduction that seems tangentially connected to the text at best. I mean, it seems totally different than what Pieper says. Yeah. How, how does that yeah. change? Oh. Well, to go back to your question, where's that shift? How does that change happen between Walther and Reinhold Pieper? Reinhold Pieper is in many ways that, and we'll see more tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, Friday a little less because delivery is pretty standard through the ages especially tomorrow and Thursday, he is a minority report in our preaching tradition. So for instance, he'll say introductions don't need to be that long. Most people are doing fairly long introductions. They're going to vary by generation topically. So Walther's not going to tell stories like Don Defner, but it'll be a long, almost like a mini doctrinal lecture. Now here's my theme, major divisions, away we go, right? Um, the idea that what you need to work on is specifically that text, that's a minority report. Now, he happens to have written a book, but in the whole scheme of things, what I'm presenting to you is not normal, really, okay, um, in the sense of here's what people actually do. I find that long, semi-tangential introductions are normal. <laughs> And I think the thing to consider whenever you're reading Walther, too, is that Walther is in his own lifetime gets to be is almost like a celebrity. So people don't people don't stand up and say that was dumb or I mean, at some point he has no peers, really. I mean, same thing. It's a miniature version of what happens with Luther. Nobody's going to be like, that was wrong or like, why are you doing that or. At a certain point, everyone just assumes that a man like that, everything he does is like profound and well thought out and correct. Right? Yeah. I, think, I think of it kind of pragmatically. Who has, who has time for that? I mean, <laughs> these people are going to listen to me yeah. for so long. Right. Why am I going to, why am I going to spend four minutes, three minutes in a yeah. sermon okay. on some... Partly because I have more, like I... They're like, I'm here for the next 45 minutes. So, so they're not going to shuffle their feet when they're well, like, where is this going? But the other thing is that when Aristotle talks about the three factors in the success of rhetoric, you've got logos. That's kind of how did I organize this stuff? Does it make sense? You've got pathos, the emotion with which it was presented. And you've got ethos, which if I can say it in English, is like your credibility. And what I'm saying is when you're CFW Walther, the ethos is covered. And one of the things that Aristotle says is ethos matters more than the other two. You could make zero sense and people are like, wow, Luther said it, right? So if you have that, then you're, you're golden. And I'm saying after a certain time, he was just golden. So, so people are like, wow, this is so great. <laughs> like, this, is, this is so deep. When you're you know, younger or newer or whatever, you have to actually prove yourself, but after a while you don't. Right, but that's sort of like a, I mean, that has to be self, I mean, check yourself as they say, right? Who's got, who cares about your brilliant illustration? Yeah, I mean, th this has to do, so we talked about planning. I promise we will take a break. We talked about planning your preaching but another thing to reflect on when you're planning your preaching, like Rummage recommends, if you did a plan last year, or if you have a sermon from that Sunday last year or whatever, compare it to what you're doing now. 
And I never thought about it quite this way until I heard a guy, Stephen Lawson, who teaches preaching at the Master's Seminary in California. And he was talking about frequency. So he was saying, he's Baptist, so he said, we used to all preach three sermons a week, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening. Now we have these multi-staff churches. We don't have Sunday services. People don't come on Wednesday. Some of us are preaching once a month on Sundays. Some of us are preaching twice. He said, I don't know how good the preachers are because basically they're not playing enough relative to what their fathers and their grandfathers did. And what he said was, if you're, going, if you're not improving, is it actually possible to stand still? Which would kind of be, that's another version of your question. Like if I'm not, if I'm not critiquing myself or someone else is not, then yeah, I'm standing up and I'm kind of gassing off and where is this going? Well, it's okay because I'm an authority. It's not good. Because he said his thinking is if I'm not getting better, is it actually possible to stand still? He doesn't think it is. So something to think about. Let's take a break. We'll, we'll take a 15 minute. It is the afternoon. So we'll come back just at about 2.30.